In the early stages of development, infants are entirely dependent on their caregivers for survival and protection. Human babies are born in a relatively underdeveloped state compared to other species, lacking the ability to fend for themselves or even regulate basic bodily functions without assistance. During these critical first years of life, the primary role of parents is to provide protection, nurturing, and support to ensure the well-being and survival of their offspring. This encompasses a range of caregiving activities, including feeding, comforting, and ensuring a safe and secure environment for the infant to grow and thrive. Physically, infants are vulnerable to a multitude of risks, from illness and injury to environmental hazards. Parents play a crucial role in safeguarding their infants from harm by providing shelter, warmth, and nourishment, as well as monitoring their health and addressing any medical needs. Moreover, parents fulfill not only the physical, but also the emotional needs of their infants during this period. Infants rely on close physical contact, affectionate interactions, and soothing reassurance from their caregivers to feel secure and develop trust in their surroundings. The bond between parent and child serves as a foundation for healthy attachment and emotional development, laying the groundwork for future social relationships and cognitive growth. Through responsive and nurturing caregiving, Parents establish a secure base from which infants can explore and interact with the world around them, gradually gaining independence and autonomy as they grow. Within this intricate framework, both mothers and fathers play distinct yet complementary roles, each contributing unique influences to their children's growth and well-being. Drawing from Jungian psychology, the father and mother archetypes represent universal symbols and patterns of behavior deeply embedded in the collective unconscious. These archetypes embody fundamental aspects of human experience and serve as symbolic representations of the roles and qualities associated with fatherhood and motherhood. The father archetype embodies the principles of authority, protection, guidance, and strength. It represents the paternal figure in its various forms, including biological fathers, father figures, mentors, and authority figures. The father archetype is often associated with qualities such as wisdom, leadership, discipline, and provision. As a symbol of authority and protection, the father represents the external world, structure, and order. Fathers are seen as providers and protectors, offering guidance and support to their children as they navigate the challenges of life. In many cultures and religious traditions, God is conceptualized as a father figure who is responsible for the creation and maintenance of the universe. By associating God with the father archetype, Humans seek a sense of security, guidance, and meaning in the universe. In Christianity, God the Father is depicted as loving, just, and omnipotent, serving as the ultimate source of guidance and protection for believers. Zeus is the king of the gods in Greek mythology, and is often depicted as a wise and just ruler, albeit with a propensity for wrath and punishment when disobeyed. Brahma is one of the principal deities in Hinduism, associated with creation and cosmic order. As the father of the universe, Brahma symbolizes the creative force that brings existence into being. He is often depicted as a bearded, four-faced deity seated on a lotus. The mother archetype embodies the principles of nurturing, caregiving, unconditional love, and emotional support. It represents the maternal figure in its various forms, including biological mothers, mother figures, caretakers, and nurturers. The mother archetype is often associated with qualities such as compassion, empathy, intuition, and emotional sensitivity. As a symbol of nurturing and emotional connection, the mother represents the inner world, warmth, and emotional nourishment. Mothers are seen as caregivers and nurturers, providing love, comfort, and support to their children as they grow and develop. The earth, as the source of life and abundance, is often personified as a nurturing and fertile mother figure. The concept of Mother Earth reflects the idea that the Earth provides for and sustains all living beings, just as a mother nurtures and cares for her children. The role of mothers holds significant importance in many major world religions, often reflected in religious texts, traditions, and beliefs. In Christianity, the figure of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of Jesus, holds a central place of reverence and veneration. Mary is often depicted as the epitome of motherhood, embodying qualities of love, compassion, and devotion. She is honored for her role in giving birth to Jesus, the Son of God, 
and for her unwavering faith and obedience to divine will. The Feast of the Annunciation and the Feast of the Nativity of Mary are among the celebrations dedicated to honoring Mary's motherhood. Hinduism reveres the concept of the mother goddess, often represented by various deities such as Durga, Lakshmi, and Sarasvati. These goddesses embody different aspects of divine feminine energy, including strength, abundance, and wisdom. Motherhood is celebrated as a sacred and divine role within Hindu culture, with mothers regarded as embodiments of nurturing love and spiritual guidance. In ancient Greek religion, Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and fertility, was revered as a maternal figure, associated with the nurturing and sustaining aspects of motherhood. Demeter's mythological narrative, particularly her search for her abducted daughter Persephone, symbolizes the cycles of life, death, and rebirth, reflecting the maternal instinct to protect and nurture one's offspring. In summary, the honoring of motherhood is a universal theme found in various religious traditions, with mothers celebrated for their sacrificial love, guidance, and nurturing care. Across different cultures and faiths, the role of mothers is regarded as sacred and worthy of reverence, embodying the divine qualities of compassion, strength, and selflessness. In Jungian psychology, both the father and mother archetypes are considered essential aspects of the individuation process, the journey towards wholeness and self-realization. Integrating and balancing these archetypal energies within the psyche is essential for achieving psychological equilibrium and personal growth. The profound dependency of children on their parents during their formative years deeply influences the significance of the father and mother archetypes in human psyche and behavior. This dependency creates a strong emotional bond between parent and child, shaping the child's understanding of themselves and the world around them. Children internalize the roles of the father and mother as models for understanding social roles, relationships, and behavior. Throughout life, individuals may continue to seek out or react to these archetypal patterns in their relationships with authority figures, partners, and caregivers. The child archetype, like all archetypes, encompasses both light and shadow aspects. On one hand, it symbolizes purity, innocence, curiosity, and the capacity for learning. Children embody a sense of wonder and openness to the world, approaching experiences with fresh eyes and untainted perspectives. However, the child also represents ignorance, particularly in the sense of lacking knowledge or experience. Children are inherently vulnerable and dependent on their caregivers for guidance and protection. Their ignorance reflects not only a lack of understanding, but also a receptivity to external influences, especially from parental figures. In this sense, the child's shadow emerges from its vulnerability and susceptibility to negative influences. If children are not nurtured or guided appropriately by parental figures, they may develop distorted perceptions, fears, or maladaptive behaviors. The ignorance of the child archetype can manifest as naivety, gullibility, or even willful disobedience if left unchecked or improperly guided. Furthermore, the child's shadow aspect may also include traits such as petulance, selfishness, or a sense of entitlement. These qualities can arise when the child's needs are not adequately met, or when they feel insecure or neglected in their environment. By recognizing and embracing these archetypal patterns, individuals can cultivate greater self-awareness, resilience, and inner harmony. The tyrannical father archetype represents the negative or shadow aspects of paternal authority and control. It embodies traits such as authoritarianism, rigidity, domination, and abuse of power. The tyrannical father exerts excessive control over others, imposing strict rules, expectations, and limitations without regard for individual autonomy or well-being. This archetype may be characterized by harsh discipline, emotional detachment, and a lack of empathy or understanding. Individuals who embody the tyrannical father archetype may struggle with issues of control, insecurity, and fear of vulnerability. They may seek to assert dominance and maintain order through coercion, manipulation, or aggression, leading to dysfunctional relationships and emotional distress. The devouring mother archetype represents the negative or shadow aspects of maternal nurturing and caregiving. The term devouring mother describes a pattern of behavior where a mother is excessively controlling, overprotective, and manipulative towards her children, often hindering their autonomy and personal growth. 
This archetype is rooted in psychological theories and is often associated with certain personality disorders such as borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. A devouring mother may exhibit behaviors that reflect an intense need for control and validation, stemming from underlying insecurities or unresolved psychological issues. She may impose unrealistic expectations on her children, demand constant attention and validation, and resist their efforts to assert independence or pursue their own interests and goals. This behavior can be suffocating and emotionally damaging to the children, as it prevents them from developing a sense of autonomy, self-confidence, and healthy boundaries. Individuals who grow up with a devouring mother may experience feelings of guilt, inadequacy, and emotional dependency. They may struggle to establish healthy relationships and assert their own needs and desires, as they have been conditioned to prioritize the needs and desires of their mother above their own. This dynamic can perpetuate a cycle of codependency and enablement, where the children feel compelled to meet the emotional needs of the mother at the expense of their own well-being. Unresolved psychological wounds, trauma, or unresolved conflicts from childhood experiences may contribute to the activation of these shadow aspects. Integrating and confronting these shadow elements is essential for achieving psychological wholeness and inner harmony. By acknowledging and working through the negative patterns and behaviors associated with the tyrannical father and devouring mother, individuals can cultivate greater self-awareness, healing, and transformation. This process of individuation enables individuals to transcend limiting beliefs and behaviors, embracing their inherent capacity for compassion, empathy, and authentic connection in their relationships and personal lives. The phenomenon of the man-child or pure can be influenced by the dynamic of the devouring mother archetype. Mother may foster an environment where her child becomes overly dependent on her for emotional support, validation, and decision-making. She may instill a sense of fear or inadequacy in her child, leading them to rely on her for guidance and reassurance in all aspects of life. As a result of the mother's overbearing influence, the child may struggle to assert their independence and take on adult responsibilities. They may avoid making decisions, confronting challenges, or taking initiative, preferring to remain in a state of dependency and passivity. The man-child may employ immature coping mechanisms to navigate the complexities of life, such as avoidance, denial, or regression. They may resort to childish behaviors or fantasies as a means of escaping reality and seeking comfort in the familiarity of the mother-child dynamic. They may exhibit stunted emotional growth and difficulty forming mature, reciprocal relationships with others. They may struggle with intimacy, vulnerability, and emotional regulation, relying on the mother as their primary source of emotional fulfillment and security. The man-child may resist efforts to encourage personal growth, self-reliance, and autonomy, fearing the loss of the mother's protection and approval. They may cling to the safety of the mother-child bond, even at the expense of their own development and well-being. The archetype of the pure Eternus or eternal boy is deeply rooted in mythology and psychology, representing a symbolic expression of perpetual youth, innocence, and idealism. In various mythological traditions, the pure archetype is associated with gods or figures who embody qualities of eternal youth, vitality, and divine renewal. The concept of the pure Eternus originates from Roman mythology, particularly in Ovid's Metamorphoses, where the child god Iacchus is addressed as pure Eternus. In this context, the pure represents a symbol of divine youth and vitality, often associated with gods of vegetation, fertility, and rebirth such as Dionysus, Attis, and Adonis. In psychology, the pure archetype was further explored and popularized by Carl Jung, who recognized it as a fundamental aspect of the collective unconscious. Jung described the pure as an unconscious psychic pattern or motif that manifests in individuals who resist the demands of adulthood and cling to a state of perpetual adolescence or immaturity. The pure is often associated with a sense of idealism, creativity, and imagination. These individuals may possess a childlike sense of wonder and curiosity about the world, embracing unconventional ideas and unconventional approaches to life. They may resist structure and routine, preferring spontaneity and freedom in their pursuits. The pure archetype is often associated with a fear of aging, mortality, and the passage of time. 
These individuals may resist growing older, clinging to youthfulness and vitality as a means of avoiding existential fears and confronting the realities of life. It's important to note that the pure archetype is not inherently negative, but rather reflects the complex interplay of psychological dynamics and developmental challenges. While aspects of the pure archetype can contribute to creativity, spontaneity, and a zest for life, an over-identification with this archetype can lead to stagnation, irresponsibility, and an inability to navigate the demands of adulthood. In answer to Job, Jung refers to the pure Eternus as a figure representing the future psychological development of human beings. He suggests that the process of individuation involves a transformation of consciousness, where the individual transcends ego consciousness and achieves a deeper understanding of the self and the world. Jung emphasizes the importance of integrating opposites within the psyche, such as light and dark, masculine and feminine, conscious and unconscious. The pure archetype represents the potential for reconciling these opposites and achieving a state of balance and harmony. Jung alludes to the character of Faust in Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's work, suggesting that Faust's transformation into the pure Eternus symbolizes a shift from a state of one-sidedness and ego inflation to a more holistic and integrated perspective. This transformation involves embracing the complexity of the human experience and transcending limited perceptions of reality. In her lectures, Marie-Louise von Franz draws parallels between the character of the Little Prince and the archetype of the pure Eternus. The Little Prince embodies qualities of innocence, curiosity, and idealism, embarking on a journey of self-discovery and encountering various characters that represent different aspects of the human psyche. Through his interactions and adventures, the Little Prince grapples with themes of love, loss, and existential meaning, ultimately achieving a deeper understanding of himself and the world around him. And Yeoman explores the character of Peter Pan as a quintessential embodiment of the pure Eternus archetype. Peter Pan is depicted as a boy who refuses to grow up, inhabiting the fantastical realm of Neverland where he engages in adventures with his companions, the Lost Boys, and confronts his arch-nemesis, Captain Hook. Peter Pan embodies qualities of freedom, spontaneity, and rebellion against authority, representing the eternal youth who resists the demands of adulthood and remains untethered to the constraints of time and responsibility. Additionally, Yeoman highlights the mythological associations of Peter Pan, linking him to figures such as the young god who dies and is reborn, Mercury or Hermes, and the great goat god Pan. These associations underscore Peter Pan's role as a liminal figure who exists between the realms of the divine and the human embodying the paradoxical nature of the eternal youth who transcends conventional boundaries and limitations. The presence of the goat in early performances of Barry's play symbolizes the thonic, primal aspects of the pure archetype, which were later toned down or removed to align with societal norms and expectations of childhood innocence. Despite these modifications, Peter Pan continues to captivate audiences with his timeless appeal and enduring relevance as a symbol of youthful vitality, imagination, and rebellion against the passage of time. The Oedipus Complex, a central concept in classical psychoanalytic theory proposed by Sigmund Freud, revolves around a child's unconscious desires and conflicts related to their parents. Freud suggested that boys experience castration anxiety, fearing punishment by the father for their desires toward the mother, while girls develop penis envy, coveting the perceived male organ they lack. Failure to resolve the complex could lead to neurosis and psychological issues in adulthood. While Freud's theory has been influential in psychoanalytic thought, it has faced criticism. Some scholars argue that Freud's shift from his earlier seduction theory, which attributed neurosis to childhood sexual abuse, to the Oedipus complex theory, may have obscured the prevalence of actual abuse. Others question its applicability to same-sex parents, and its compatibility with societal norms against incest. Despite these critiques, the Oedipus complex remains a foundational concept in psychoanalysis, contributing to our understanding of unconscious desires and conflicts in human development. Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex, written around 429 BC, explores the tragic story of Oedipus, who unwittingly fulfills a prophecy by killing his father and marrying his mother. This mythological narrative has had a profound impact on Western culture, influencing literature, psychology, and philosophy. 
In the late 19th century, the play experienced a resurgence in popularity, with successful productions in Paris and Vienna. Sigmund Freud, the Austrian neurologist and founder of psychoanalysis, attended these performances and was deeply influenced by Sophocles' exploration of unconscious desires and guilt. Freud's interpretation of the Oedipus myth is outlined in his seminal work, The Interpretation of Dreams, first published in 1899. He posited that the Oedipal sentiment, characterized by a son's desire for his mother and hostility toward his father, is a universal psychological phenomenon inherent in human nature. Freud believed that this complex has been inherited over millions of years of human evolution, leading to unconscious feelings of guilt and conflict. Freud's analysis of the Oedipus myth was informed by his clinical observations of neurotic and normal children, as well as his own response to Oedipus Rex. He argued that the play's timeless appeal lies in its exploration of fundamental human experiences, such as the desire for forbidden objects and the conflict between instinctual drives and societal norms. Freud also drew parallels between Oedipus Rex and Shakespeare's Hamlet, suggesting that both works explore similar themes of repressed desires and unconscious conflicts. However, he also emphasized that the Oedipus complex predates the play itself, originating in ancient myths and legends. Freud's original formulation of the Oedipus complex focused primarily on boys or men, and he did not fully clarify his views on how the complex might manifest in girls or women. In his early work, he described the Oedipus complex as a young boy's ambivalent feelings of both desire and hostility toward his father, along with a desire to possess his mother sexually. The term Oedipus complex was introduced by Freud in a 1910 article titled A Special Type of Choice of Object Made by Men. In this paper, Freud discussed how a boy's awareness of prostitution might trigger memories and desires from his early childhood, leading to a resurgence of certain mental impulses. The boy begins to desire his mother in a sexual sense, and to resent his father, as a rival for her affections, thus falling under the dominance of the Oedipus complex. Freud suggested that the boy's feelings of hostility toward his father stem from a sense of betrayal, as he perceives his mother's sexual activity with his father as an act of unfaithfulness. This resentment and desire for the mother, combined with hostility toward the father, characterized the Oedipus complex in Freud's theory. In classical psychoanalytic theory, the Oedipus complex is believed to unfold during the phallic stage of development, typically occurring between the ages of three and six years old, although it may manifest at earlier stages as well. During this crucial period, children undergo significant psychological and sexual development. In the phallic stage, children become increasingly aware of their bodies, as well as the bodies of others, including their parents. This newfound awareness often leads them to explore themselves and others physically, gratifying their curiosity and learning about anatomical and gender differences between males and females. Despite the mother typically being the primary caregiver who satisfies the child's desires during early development, the child begins to form a distinct gender identity as either a boy or a girl. This shift in identity alters the dynamics of the parent-child relationship, as the parents become objects of the child's burgeoning sexual energy. In the case of a boy, he directs his libido, or sexual desire, toward his mother, while also experiencing feelings of jealousy and emotional rivalry toward his father. The boy's desire for his mother is often accompanied by a desire for the removal or death of his father, and he may even harbor impulses to bring about his father's demise. These desires typically arise from the ID, the part of the psyche governed by the pleasure principle. However, the ego, which operates according to the reality principle, recognizes the impracticality and social taboo of these desires and seeks to repress them. The boy's ambivalence toward his father's role in the family may also manifest as a fear of castration rooted in the perception of the father as physically dominant. This fear represents an irrational and subconscious manifestation of the infantile ID, reflecting the child's internal conflict and struggle to navigate complex familial dynamics. In both sexes, defense mechanisms serve as temporary solutions to the conflict between the instinctual drives of the ID and the reality-based demands of the ego. The first defense mechanism, repression, involves pushing unacceptable thoughts and impulses into the unconscious mind, 
but it doesn't resolve the underlying conflict. Instead, it keeps the impulse suppressed in the unconscious, where it continues to exert influence. The second defense mechanism is identification, wherein the child adopts traits and characteristics of the same-sex parent into their own personality, incorporating them into their ego and superego. For boys, this process helps alleviate castration anxiety by aligning them with their father, thereby protecting them from the perceived threat of emasculation. Similarly, girls identify with their mother, recognizing their shared lack of a penis and dispelling any sense of antagonism. A satisfactory resolution of the Oedipus complex is crucial for the development of the male infantile superego. By identifying with the father figure, the boy internalizes societal norms and morality potentially evolving into a self-regulating individual who voluntarily adheres to social rules rather than merely obeying out of fear of punishment. Conversely, unresolved competition with the father for the mother's affection can lead to fixation during the phallic stage, resulting in the development of aggressive, overambitious, and narcissistic traits in adulthood. In analysis of a phobia in a five-year-old boy, 1909, the case study of the equinophobic boy Little Hans, Freud showed that the relation between Hans's fears of horses and of his father derived from external factors, the birth of a sister, and internal factors, the desire of the infantile ID to replace his father as companion to his mother, and guilt for enjoying the masturbation normal to a boy of his age. Little Hans himself was unable to relate his fear of horses to his fear of his father. As the treating psychoanalyst, Freud noted that Hans had to be told many things that he could not say himself and that he had to be presented with thoughts, which he had, so far, shown no signs of possessing. In response to Freud's proposition of the Oedipus complex, which primarily focused on the little boy's experience of desiring the mother and feeling jealous rivalry towards the father, Carl Jung, a student and collaborator of Freud, introduced the concept of the Electra complex. Jung proposed that girls undergo a similar developmental stage characterized by desires for the father and aggression towards the mother. The term Electra complex is derived from Greek mythology, specifically from the story of Electra, who along with her brother Orestes, sought matricidal revenge against their mother Clytemnestra and her lover Aegisthus for the murder of their father Agamemnon. This myth provided Jung with a symbolic representation of the dynamics he observed in his female patients. Jung's proposition of the Electra complex mirrored Freud's concept of the Oedipus complex but applied it to girls' psychosexual development. However, orthodox Jungian psychology only uses the term Oedipus complex to describe a boy's experience, maintaining that girls undergo a separate developmental process. Freud himself rejected the equivalence between the Oedipus and Electra complexes, arguing that they did not have analogous relations between boys and girls. Freud contended that only boys experience simultaneous love for one parent and competitive hatred for the other during this developmental stage. He believed that the Electra complex failed to consider the differing effects of the castration complex and the significance of the phallus in the two sexes. Additionally, Freud noted that the Electra complex overlooked the pre-oedipal attachment that girls typically have with their mothers, emphasizing the unique nature of the mother-daughter relationship in psychosexual development. Jacques Lacan, a prominent figure in psychoanalysis, argued against diminishing the significance of the Oedipus complex in psychosexual development. He believed that the Oedipus complex remained central in shaping subjective experience and marking the introduction to the symbolic order, the realm of culture and language that transcends individual desires. According to Lacan, going through the Oedipus complex allows a child to learn about power, and the existence of a symbolic system independent of themselves, thus facilitating their integration into society. Lacan proposed that the Oedipus complex liberates individuals from the dual relationship of the son-mother dynamic, allowing them to understand the multiplicity of perspectives and the oddity of possessing one's own mind. This perspective was further developed by later psychoanalysts, such as Balas and Ronald Britton, who emphasized the Oedipus complex's role in fostering self-reflection and understanding interpersonal interactions. Michael Parsons suggested viewing the Oedipus complex as a lifelong developmental challenge, with new configurations emerging in later life. 
Freud himself acknowledged the increasing importance of the Oedipus complex in psychoanalytic studies and considered its recognition a distinguishing factor between adherents and opponents of psychoanalysis. However, by the late 20th century, some object relations psychologists began to downplay the significance of the Oedipus complex, focusing instead on earlier developmental stages and the mother-child relationship. Despite this, Ego psychology continued to assert the formative influence of the Oedipal period on adult life, emphasizing its role in shaping love, work, ambitions, and other aspects of human existence. The father complex in psychology refers to a set of unconscious associations or impulses related to the image or archetype of the father. These associations can be either positive, involving admiration and a tendency to seek out older father figures, or negative, characterized by feelings of distrust or fear. Sigmund Freud and subsequent psychoanalysts viewed the father complex, especially ambivalent feelings toward the father experienced by male children, as an integral aspect of the Oedipus complex. In contrast, Carl Jung proposed a broader understanding of the father complex. He believed that both males and females could develop a father complex, and it could manifest as either positive or negative feelings. The term father complex emerged from the collaboration between Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung during the early 20th century. This collaboration occurred at a time when Freud noted that neurotics struggled with the same complexes that affect normal individuals. Freud's exploration of the father complex was exemplified in his study of the rat man in 1909, where he identified reactivation of childhood struggles against paternal authority as a central element in the patient's compulsions. In subsequent writings, such as in his analysis of Schrieber in 1911, Freud continued to emphasize the significance of the father complex in psychoanalytic theory. He observed that the father complex, characterized by fear, defiance, and disbelief of the father, often presented as a major resistance to treatment in male patients. The father complex remained a key concept in Freud's work, including in Totem and Taboo, 1912-13, and The Future of an Illusion, 1927. Although the term complex became somewhat controversial among Freudians after his split with Jung, the father complex continued to play a prominent role in psychoanalytic discourse, with its ambivalent nature being acknowledged by Freud and his contemporaries. After the Freud and Jung split, Jung also continued to utilize the concept of the father complex to explore father-son relationships and their psychological implications. Jung observed how a positive father complex could lead to an over-readiness to believe in authority, while a negatively charged father complex could influence a woman's perception of men as uncooperative and judgmental. Both Freud and Jung utilized the concept of the father complex not only in their theoretical work but also in their personal relationship. As their professional and personal intimacy deepened, Jung expressed a desire to perceive Freud, not as an equal but as a father figure. This dynamic reflected Jung's own complex feelings towards authority and mentorship. However, in hindsight, both Jungians and Freudians have noted how Jung's relationship with Freud was characterized by a dualistic father complex. While Jung initially embraced Freud as a mentor and father figure, there were underlying tensions and conflicts that pointed to a negative father complex beneath the positive facade. Despite appearing as the favorite son, Jung harbored doubts about Freud's theories and methods which eventually led to significant disagreements and ruptures in their relationship. These conflicts eventually came to the surface, with Jung accusing Freud of maintaining a paternalistic attitude towards his students and disciples. Jung's efforts to break free from the influence of his psychoanalytic father figure led him to reject the term father complex as a form of Viennese name-calling. Despite having used the concept himself to analyze similar dynamics in the past, Jung sought to distance himself from the label as he sought to assert his independence from Freud and the psychoanalytic movement. The concept of the father complex has undergone significant evolution over time, reflecting changing societal and cultural attitudes towards paternal authority. Initially conceived to address the dominance of the Victorian patriarch, by the turn of the millennium, there emerged a postmodern concern with the absence or loss of paternal authority. In contrast to Freudian theory, which emphasized the role of the father in the development of the child's psyche, object relations theory shifted the focus towards the mother. However, psychoanalysis continued to grapple with the significance of the father, particularly in terms of the impact of his absence 
on the individual's psychological development. From a French perspective, the term father complex began to fade from contemporary psychoanalytic discourse. Instead, scholars like James Herzog introduced concepts such as father hunger, which underscored the son's longing for connection with a paternal figure. Nevertheless, Jungian analysts, including Eric Newman, persisted in exploring the father complex and its implications for the father-son relationship. They highlighted how premature identification with the father could lead to conservative attitudes, while rebellion against the father complex manifested in the archetype of the eternal son. This analysis was also applied to women with negative father complexes, who might exhibit resistance to male authority and suggestions. Overall, the concept of the father complex continues to be relevant in psychoanalytic discourse, albeit with varying degrees of emphasis and interpretation. In recent years, the concept of father hunger has gained traction in the field of eating disorders and psychoanalytic theory, particularly in relation to the impact of paternal absence on individuals, especially daughters. Margot de Main, an expert in eating disorders, explored the notion of father hunger in her book Fathers, Daughters and Food, highlighting how paternal absence can lead to an unhealthy form of narcissism and a pervasive search for external sources of self-esteem particularly in daughters. She examined how unmet father hunger can contribute to disordered eating and other mental health issues. James Herzog further delved into the theme of father hunger in his work Father Hunger. Explorations with adults and children, addressing the unconscious longing experienced by both males and females for an involved father figure. Herzog's exploration underscores the importance of paternal provisions during various developmental stages for both sons and daughters. Additionally, Michael J. Diamond's writings, such as My Father Before Me, examine the significance of fatherly involvement in children's lives and its impact on their psychological development. From a Jungian perspective, emphasis is placed on the power of parental hunger, which compels individuals to repeatedly seek out unfulfilled aspects of the father archetype in the external world. One suggested that solution for men grappling with father hunger is to transition into generativity wherein they strive to find the lost father within themselves and pass on this internal father figure to future generations. This shift involves moving from seeking parental guidance to providing it, thus completing a transformative journey towards psychological integration and maturity. The concept of the father complex continues to resonate in popular culture, influencing perceptions and relationships in various ways. For instance, renowned poet and writer Czesław Miloš described his admiration for Albert Einstein, attributing it to his own father complex and yearning for a protector and leader. In the case of musician Bob Dylan, his choice of pseudonym has been interpreted as a rejection of his actual father and the paternal name associated with him. Dylan's search for father figures, or idols, as he termed them, reflects his ongoing quest for guidance and mentorship, although he tended to move on from each figure after a period of time. On the other hand, English novelist D. H. Lawrence expressed skepticism toward the notion of the father complex as it pertained to himself, dismissing it as a simplistic and misguided concept. Lawrence's rejection of the idea suggests a nuanced understanding of individual psychology and the complexities of father-child relationships. Parent-offspring conflict refers to the evolutionary tension that arises from differences in optimal fitness between parents and their offspring. This theory, proposed by Robert Trivers in 1974, builds upon the broader framework of the selfish gene theory, which posits that genes act in their own self-interest to maximize their propagation. Parent-offspring conflict theory explains many observed biological phenomena, shedding light on the complex dynamics of familial relationships across species. One example of parent-offspring conflict is seen in certain bird species where parents typically lay multiple eggs and attempt to raise multiple young. However, due to limited resources, such as food, the strongest offspring often outcompetes its siblings for parental investment. In extreme cases, the dominant offspring may even resort to aggressive behaviors, such as suicide, where weaker siblings are killed to eliminate competition for resources. This phenomenon underscores the inherent tension between parental investment and offspring survival strategies. While parents seek to distribute resources evenly among offspring to maximize overall reproductive success, 
individual offspring may benefit by monopolizing resources and outcompeting siblings. As a result, parent offspring conflict plays a crucial role in shaping reproductive strategies and behaviors across various species. Throughout history, conflicts between mothers and their children have been documented, with some cases escalating to murder. One notable example is the conflict between Cleopatra III of Egypt and her son Ptolemy IX, which resulted in violence and bloodshed. In modern cultures, matricide, the killing of one's mother, and filicide, the killing of one's son or daughter, have been subjects of study, but they remain poorly understood. Psychosis and schizophrenia are common underlying causes of both matricide and filicide, often leading individuals to commit these acts while experiencing severe mental illness. Certain risk factors have been identified in cases of filicide, including a history of domestic abuse, particularly among young, indigent mothers. Additionally, mothers are more likely to commit filicide than fathers, especially when the child is eight years old or younger. Matricide, on the other hand, is most frequently committed by adult sons. In the United States, data from 2012 indicate that there were 130 matricides, 0.4 per million people, and 383 filicides, 1.2 per million, amounting to an average of 1.4 incidents per day. These statistics underscore the prevalence of these tragic events within modern society. Filicide, the tragic act of a parent intentionally killing their own child, is a deeply distressing phenomenon that has been studied extensively. A comprehensive longitudinal study, conducted in the United Kingdom between 1997 and 2006 sheds light on some key insights into this devastating behavior. The study, which analyzed 297 cases of filicide and 45 cases of filicide suicide, revealed several significant findings. Approximately 37% of the perpetrators had a documented mental illness at the time of the crime. Mood disorders and personality disorders were the most common diagnoses, with psychosis accounting for 15% of cases. However, it's notable that the majority of perpetrators had not been in contact with mental health services prior to the tragic events, indicating a gap in mental health support and treatment. Female perpetrators were more likely to have given birth during their teenage years, suggesting potential stressors related to early motherhood. On the other hand, fathers who committed filicide were more likely to have a history of violent offenses and substance misuse. They were also more likely to target multiple victims in their actions. Infants were found to be at higher risk of becoming victims of filicide compared to older children. Additionally, there was a suggested link between postpartum depression and the occurrence of filicide, highlighting the importance of mental health support for new mothers. Dr. Philip Resnick's seminal research on filicide, conducted in 1969, identified five primary motives behind the tragic act of a parent killing their own child. In altruistic filicide, the parent believes that the world is too harsh or cruel for the child to endure, or perceives the child to be suffering, whether this suffering is real or imagined. The parent may believe that killing the child is an act of mercy, sparing them from perceived future suffering. Fatal maltreatment refers to cases where the parent's actions, although not explicitly aimed at killing the child, result in the child's death due to neglect, abuse, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Munchausen syndrome by proxy involves a caregiver fabricating or inducing illness in a child to garner attention or sympathy. Filicide driven by the perception of the child as unwanted occurs when the parent sees the child as an impediment to their own happiness or goals. The parent may view the child as a burden or obstacle and may resort to extreme measures to eliminate this perceived problem. In cases of acute psychosis, the parent experiences a severe break from reality, often due to mental illness or psychotic episodes. The parent may act on delusions, hallucinations, or irrational beliefs, leading to the tragic outcome of filicide. Filicide driven by spousal revenge involves the parent harming or killing the child as a means of indirectly harming their domestic partner. These instances are rare but underscore the complex interplay of interpersonal dynamics within the family unit. Glenn Carruthers, in his work on spousal revenge filicide, suggests that perpetrators may view their own children as mere objects or tools in their quest for revenge against their partner.
In the biblical narrative of Judges 11, Jephthah, a judge of Israel, makes a rash vow to sacrifice the first thing that comes out of his house to God if he is victorious in battle. Tragically, his daughter is the first to greet him upon his return. Despite her pleas, Jephthah feels compelled to fulfill his vow, and his daughter accepts her fate with dignity. This story raises complex moral questions about the consequences of impulsive decisions and the interpretation of religious obligations. Lucius Junius Brutus, traditionally regarded as one of the founders of the Roman Republic, faced a heartbreaking decision when his sons Titus and Tiberius were implicated in a plot to restore the monarchy, which Brutus had helped overthrow. In order to uphold the principles of the fledgling republic and ensure the stability of the state, Brutus chose to execute his own sons, prioritizing the welfare of the republic over his personal ties to his children. Aulus Postumius Tiburtus, a Roman dictator in 431 BC, is said to have ordered the execution of his own son after he abandoned his assigned post to launch an unauthorized attack on the enemy. This act underscores the importance of discipline, duty, and obedience within the Roman military ethos. However, the historicity of this event is questioned by some scholars due to similarities with other Roman tales, such as those involving Titus Manlius Imperiosus Torquatus. Patricide, or the act of killing one's own father, is a recurring motif in mythology and cultural narratives across various civilizations. In the Greek creation myth, Cronus, jealous of his father Uranus' power as ruler of the universe, castrated or killed him. Later, Cronus himself was overthrown by his son, Zeus, in a similar act of patricide. Oedipus, as we mentioned earlier, was fated to kill his father, a king, and marry his mother. Unaware of his true identity, Oedipus encounters his father while traveling and inadvertently kills him, fulfilling the prophecy. Pelias, king of Iolcus, was killed by his own daughters, who were deceived by Medea into believing that he could be resurrected. This act of patricide was orchestrated as revenge for Pelia's mistreatment of Medea and her husband, Jason. In the Mahabharata, Babravahana, the son of Arjuna, inadvertently kills his father in battle. However, Arjuna is later revived by his wife, the snake goddess Ulipi. Chinese mythology holds that individuals who commit patricide, or matricide, may face punishment from the filial and warrior deity Erlang Shin in the form of a lightning strike. In Norse mythology, Fafnir murders his father, Hrydmar, to obtain a cursed golden ring. Some versions of the tale suggest that Fafnir's brother, Regan, assisted him in this act. These stories illustrate the profound and often tragic complexities of parent-child relationships, moral dilemmas, and the interplay between familial loyalty and broader societal obligations. They continue to resonate through the ages, prompting reflection on the nature of sacrifice, duty, and the sacrifices individuals may be called upon to make in service of higher ideals or greater goods. The commandment honor thy father and thy mother is one of the Ten Commandments found in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in Exodus 20 verse 12 and Deuteronomy 5 verse 16. It is considered a foundational principle in both Jewish and Christian traditions, emphasizing the importance of respecting and honoring one's parents. In different religious traditions, the commandment to honor parents is placed differently within the list of the Ten Commandments. In Protestant and Jewish sources, it is generally regarded as the Fifth Commandment. However, Catholics and Lutherans count it as the Fourth Commandment. The commandment to honor parents is interpreted as a directive to show respect, obedience, and gratitude towards one's parents. It encompasses various forms of honoring, including providing for their needs in old age seeking their counsel and guidance, and treating them with kindness and reverence. Historically, the Ten Commandments, including the commandment to honor parents, were enforced as legal statutes in many jurisdictions. Even today, some religious communities consider them to be enforceable moral and ethical laws that guide behavior and relationships within society. According to Exodus 20 verse 1, the Ten Commandments were spoken by Yahweh and inscribed on two stone tablets by the finger of God. This divine origin imbues the commandment with a sense of sacredness and authority, emphasizing its significance in religious and ethical teachings. The commandment to honor parents reflects the importance of family values and intergenerational relationships within society. 
It highlights the role of parents as providers, caregivers, and moral guides, whose wisdom and experience are worthy of respect and appreciation. In addition to its practical and ethical implications, honoring parents is also seen as a spiritual practice in many religious traditions. By showing reverence towards one's parents, individuals cultivate virtues such as humility, gratitude, and compassion, fostering spiritual growth and moral development. According to Jewish law, children are obligated to obey their parents when the command given is reasonable and permissible under Jewish law. For example, if a parent asks a child to perform a task such as bringing water, the child must obey. However, honoring God and adhering to the laws of the Torah take precedence over obeying parents. If a parent asks a child to violate a law of the Torah, such as bowing down to idols, the child must refuse to obey in order to maintain fidelity to God's commandments. The obligation to honor one's parents extends even after their deaths. Children are encouraged to honor their parents' memory through practices such as reciting Kaddish for eleven months and on the anniversary of their death, Yarzite, donating to charity in their memory, and engaging in the study of Torah, which is seen as a form of reverence toward the parent who raised a worthy child. Jewish tradition emphasizes the importance of respectful behavior towards parents, both in speech and action. Children are instructed not to shame or speak arrogantly to their parents, nor are they permitted to interrupt, contradict, or disturb a parent's sleep. While children are generally expected to obey their parents' wishes, there are exceptions, particularly in matters of marriage. A child is not required to obey if a parent dictates whom they should marry or prohibits a marriage that is permissible under Jewish law. Children are encouraged to maintain communication with their parents, particularly when traveling, in order to prevent them from worrying. This demonstrates care and consideration for the well-being of parents. The teachings of Jesus and the writings of Paul underscore the importance of honoring one's parents within Christian tradition, emphasizing both spiritual and practical dimensions of this obligation. In the Gospels, Jesus reinforces the commandment to honor one's father and mother, affirming its significance in the moral and ethical framework of Christianity. He teaches that obedience to parents is a righteous and commendable practice, echoing the commandment given in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus and Paul emphasized the obligation of adult children to provide for the material needs of their parents, particularly in their old age. Both Jesus and Paul condemned those who neglect their familial responsibilities under the pretext of religious devotion, highlighting the importance of practical acts of love and care towards one's parents. While honoring parents is deemed important, Jesus also teaches that one's allegiance to God should take precedence over all other relationships including those with parents. This principle is illustrated in Jesus' statement, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, emphasizing the primacy of devotion to God above all else. Paul's instructions to Timothy regarding the care of widows underscore the broader principle of familial responsibility within the Christian community. Children and grandchildren are encouraged to prioritize the practice of their faith by caring for their own family members, including parents and grandparents as an expression of devotion to God. By fulfilling their duty to care for their parents and grandparents, individuals demonstrate their commitment to living out their faith in practical ways, thereby pleasing God and fulfilling the commandment. Honoring one's parents is a fundamental value, rooted in the recognition of the sacrifices and love parents provide for their children. While there may be exceptions, the majority of parents strive to provide the best for their children often making significant sacrifices along the way. The commandment to honor thy father and thy mother emphasizes the importance of reciprocating that love and respect, acknowledging the profound bond between parents and children. It serves as a reminder to cherish and appreciate the guidance, support, and unconditional love that parents offer throughout their lives.